International Space Station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Yes, I am. C-SPAN, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is C-SPAN. How do you hear me? C-SPAN, station, station has you loud and clear. We go in five, four, three, two, one. Joining us from the International Space Station is Commander Steven Swanson, who is currently on board. Commander Swanson, welcome to C-SPAN. Thank you very much. Commander Swanson, if we wouldn't mind, tell us a little bit about the current activities of the International Space Station. How many members of crew do you have? And generally, what are you doing? Good question. We have six crew members up here right now, three Russians, two Americans, and one German. Uh, mostly we do is science up here. We have over 170 experiments going on right now. Uh, but also we have to maintain the station and keep it running smoothly and efficiently. Commander, with the science experiments that you're currently conducting, can you tell us a couple of things? Generally, what areas do they fall into, and why is it that these need to be conducted in an atmosphere such as yours? Yeah, so they vary tremendously. We have outside the alpha magnetic spectrometer, which is looking for dark energy and dark matter. Uh, something that we're trying to figure out, just the basic physics of how uh, our universe came to, to uh, be. Uh, from that, we also go all the way to uh, human research on our bodies. Uh, how do we uh, change uh, in the microgravity environment? Uh, can specifically our eyes, our muscles, our bones, and we're looking in details about that. And that can have applications all uh, on Earth, on people with different diseases have the same kind of reactions. We just get to see it at a more rapid pace up here. And that's pretty much for all the science. The idea here is uh, things change up here enough that people can analyze how different uh, pieces or, or science uh, objectives uh, change in this microgravity environment. It's, it's just different than on Earth, and that gives them another data set to look at and co to compare to, and that, in a sense, gives them a lot more understanding of the problem. So, Commander, because you're up there in microgravity, talk a little bit about the, the, the extent of the science. Is it, are we talking basic research or advanced research? Well, it's both. I mean, I, I feel um, advanced research is looking for dark energy. There's also advanced research we do in combustion and in cancer research. We're looking at T cells. But there's also just basic science research. We're trying to understand certain uh, basic physics properties and all sorts of other things. So it, it is both. There's just so much science going on. It's just amazing. Uh, the experiments that you conduct. How many are NASA-sanctioned, taxpayer-funded? How many come from private sources, experiments that you take on from other sources? You know, I don't really know the numbers, but they're right. They definitely come from different areas. Uh, we do have some NASA ones. We have some actually from the European Space Agency. We have some from the Japanese Space Agency. We have some from the Russians. And then we have a whole uh, group called CASIS, which takes in science experiments from all over the U.S. and combines them into uh, a sort of a group from that area. And uh, they get to fly also on board, too. And so it's a, it's a whole bunch of different places that I know our, science come, our experiments come from. I just don't know the correct numbers. You spoke about life in microgravity. I suspect, and you, and you kind of addressed this, the toll it takes on a body. Could you give our folks an example of what it's like being you there living in an atmosphere without gravity, and if you could move around a little bit just to give the folks a sense of what it's like? Yeah, that's a good thing. You know, first of all, you can see anything you hold just floats when you let go of it. And that is good and bad. One, it doesn't drop to the ground. But the bad thing is, if I don't watch this in about 10 seconds, it's going to float off, and I'll probably will take me another hour to find it. So that's a negative of that. But you're right, moving around is also very much fun. So I'll give you a quick example of uh, some things you can do.
Yeah, I'm not a gymnast on earth, so I, that's, this is the only place I get to do that. How long did it take you to get to the use of that? Do you hit your head and things like that? Oh, definitely at the beginning. Uh, it's definitely more difficult. We have a little competitions now, and it's the idea is you have to get the rotation without any side movement. And then you can see how many rotations you can do before you hit something. So that's a little competition we run up here. Uh, give our viewers a sense of how large the station is. We're only seeing a small portion of it, but what are we talking size-wise? Well, it's about the volume of a 747, really. And so it's quite big. It's quite large. It's uh, about 250 feet long, and at certain spots it's maybe 130, 40 feet wide at certain spots. So it's actually quite, quite big for volume-wise. There's only six people up here, so it's not like you're crowded up here at all. So you said there were six people, uh, again, uh, from different uh, countries working together on this. What's, it li what's the working relationship like between the countries? Well, it's a very good re working relationship up here. Um, we've trained together beforehand as a crew, and so we got to know each other very well. And we still work together on a daily basis. And we have uh, really no issues. I mean, yes, there's always cultural differences, but we've learned those. We've learned how to get uh, around any issues. And so we're all good friends now up here, and it seems to go quite smoothly. Commander, here on Earth, there are current issues concerning tensions between uh, the United States and Russia. You have three Russian cosmonauts on board. Do those issues get discussed on board, and do you get any discussions about what's going on on Earth? Uh, yes, they do get discussed, just like any news event that comes on. We will discuss it. Uh, it's not like there's any um, negative to it, though. It's more we understand it's politics going on. We understand all that. We also understand it doesn't affect our work and our relationship with each other. We're always friends. And so it really doesn't affect us, but it is discussed. What are the nature of the discussions like? Oh, that's a good question. It, it varies depending, of course, on the topic. But on, say, the, the U.S.-Russian relations, we uh, just could delve into you know, more in the politics of each country and, and, uh, and, and more in the, I guess, more of the details about the, the cultures and what that means in each country. And kind of it's, if you break it down that way, you can kind of see what's going on a little clearly, a little more clearly. On the science side, Commander, for, uh, for instance, if Russia decided one t at one point because of relations here they wanted to pull back on work of uh, the space station, how is the United States affected by that? And what goes on, and how is the science experiment affected by that? Well, right now the science is pretty much separated between the U.S. side, or I should say the U.S., uh, which includes uh, the European, European Space Agency, uh, JAXA, Canada, uh, all those, and then the Russian side. So the science is somewhat separated. Uh, however, we do require the uh, Russians for us to get up here and to get back down right now. Hopefully in a few years we won't need that, but right now we need uh, that to, to happen, and that is the, probably the biggest deal right there. If, and if we can't get up here, we can't do the science. Commander, you can move around if you wish. If you're tired holding that position, if you want to take the, the mic with you. Um, as far as manning and staffing the station, um, many of, much of that now depends on commercial aircraft, uh, commercial spacecraft. What's been the experience with these commercial spacecraft staffing and supplying the station? Right now they're just supplying the station, and uh, we're very happy that we have uh, American cargo vehicles coming up. It's a great uh, advancement. These are good vehicles. Uh, so it does offload our dependence upon uh, Russia and uh, other countries for that. So we are happy about that, and we are definitely looking forward to the next development when we do get to do crew on an American vehicle, and that will uh, change our dynamic quite a bit. Uh, but for right now, it's just uh, the cargo coming up, and uh, matter of fact, hopefully we'll have one here in uh, less than a month to come up here and, and give us some new food and new science to work on. Uh, as far as you said the, the next step, what's involved in the next step and how, how do things change? Oh, sorry, yes, the next step. Well, the next step is actually um, proving out the vehicle is safe for uh, humans, which are, we have a few companies now who are bidding for that uh, opportunity right now. 
And uh, once they start into their project, the end of that project, hopefully by 2017, we will have a manned test of an American vehicle at that time. And they'll probably do one test flight, uh, maybe to station, maybe not. Uh, but then the next ones from then on will start being uh, rotating crew members on the American vehicle. How much input do you and the other crew members have to these private companies? How is it received? Well, I personally don't have input, but our astronaut office and NASA does have input. And so uh, I believe it's received quite well from talking to the folks who do that work. And uh, because the, these companies want to uh, succeed, they want the contracts and they want to build a good vehicle, they really do. And so they do listen and they try to make the best vehicle they can. Of course, it is a cost analysis going on at the same time. So they can't build you know, the most luxurious uh, Cadillac out there. However, they build a good vehicle. Uh, Commander, you talked about moving forward these dates of 2017 that you talked about. As far as the station itself, how long is it going to remain functional? That's a good question. Right now, I believe it's done paper to 2024. And that's just more to certify the life of certain uh, components and also for the resupply missions for certain things. Uh, so it could, it could go longer if we wanted. It all depends on where we want to spend our money. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, if we want to go, uh, the NASA budget is limited. And there is a, you know, a portion of it goes to space station and keeping it running. And so if we all of a sudden have a different uh, task that we want to take on, say going to the moon or Mars or an asteroid or wherever it happens to be, uh, we might not be able to do both at the same time given how, uh, how big each plan is. Um, what's the role of the station in future manned space flight, say, past the moon? Well, right now, I think what I mean for helping out in our future space flight, the station is a test bed. We test all sorts of things out up here. You know, right now we have a recycling system for water that we're working on. And so we recycle all our water, you know, condensate, urine, everything. And we need that if we're going to go other places. And that's just one example. There's many different examples we have like that. But we're testing out new technologies up here that will enable us to go farther. So you would say the station's needed past 2024? Well, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure it's needed. It would definitely be a good test bed for all sorts of things. We can easily get things up and down from here uh, more than you could if you were going on a long mission somewhere else. So that's why you can, if you want to make an update to your, your product or your, your equipment, you can do that more easily. So it's a great test bed. Um, however, again, though, it's all about uh, having a limited amount of money and where you want to spend your money and what are your objectives. So if, say, by 2024, nothing's decided as far as the future of the station, what happens to it? Does it just fall to, to Earth? Well, it, 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 again, that's going to be a decision uh, for, uh, for a management, uh, you know, the, 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 I guess I would consider the, our politicians and the and NASA administration. Uh, however, if it does, if they decide that it is no longer needed, yes, they will deorbit the station and, and it will burn up on reentry. Uh, Commander Swanson, we uh, every day go through our normal lives here on a gravity atmosphere. What's it like on a day-to-day -day level in a weightless atmosphere? Tell our viewers some of the things they might not expect about living in space, the things you kind of have to overcome because of the environment you're in. Yeah, um, it's really the, the simple things that, that are much more difficult up here. I mean, uh, you know, you're getting up in the morning and just uh, shaving and getting yourself ready in the morning. I have to admit, my commute is awful uh, short. It's from about 20 feet behind me, so I don't have to go far. But I still, just little things like that in the morning, it just you don't have a, a sink to wash up in. And your water doesn't, of course, run down. So then you have to shave totally differently. You have to brush your teeth differently. Uh, eating is also a chore because uh, everything floats again and it comes in packages and it all wants to go everywhere. Uh, so all these little things and even, uh, you know, tying your shoe actually ends up being difficult for some reason. We 
use gravity to bend over to take it to your, your shoe. Uh, you don't have that here, so you, you have to be a little more flexible. Just all these little things that you didn't think about um, make it just a little uh, less efficient uh, to be up here. However, I say there are many benefits. We do love it up here. Uh, this whole, the whole floating thing is just a, a very fun thing to do. Looking out the window is fantastic. It, it just can't be beat. So, so, Commander Swanson, though, once you return to Earth living in the environment you're currently living in, what happens? How does your body adjust? That's a good question. We uh, work out two hours every day up here to help in that return. And the idea is that we, so our muscles will be strong and our bones will not lose any bone density. And that way, when we get back, we just really have to worry about, we call it our neural vestibular system. And uh, once that gets back under control, which it varies uh, uh, to a lot between people. And so uh, but once that gets back under control, uh, you're still strong and your bones are good. So it just takes about six weeks worth of rehab right now. And you're back up into the 95 percentile, uh, maybe even higher than that, uh, how you're feeling and what you can do. Um, when you return to Earth, how long have you been on board the space station? I've been on board about two and a half months and I return in three months. Your background is in computer science. How do you end up an astronaut on a space station? A good question. Well, I did go to work for NASA, which was a big help for me. And, and I decided that being an astronaut was a goal. So um, uh, really what I also worked on was aircraft control systems. That's where my main work at NASA was on. And that, of course, could play into working on the shuttle and also then helping out. And then I just got lucky in the selection process. That's really, there's so many qualified people who try to be astronauts. It takes a little bit of luck just to get in. And I just happened to get a little lucky. I had all the requirements needed and just a little bit of luck, and I made it. So, Commander, in about 30 seconds, tell us about the best experience you've had on board the station itself. Oh, the best experience is... Um, well, probably they're always looking out the window, and the best way to look out the window is not have a window in front of you. That's going on a spacewalk. And so that's probably the best experience, heading out the door. It's a, it's a good time. It's just a fantastic feeling. It is a little, you know, a little pressure uh, on you at the same time, but, boy, it's quite an experience, and it's something I'm looking forward to doing again. Commander Steven Swanson, who is on board the International Space Station, talking to us about experiences there. Commander... Thanks for talking with C-SPAN. My pleasure. Take care. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event.